From the year 2000 to 2010, the number of testosterone prescriptions quadrupled, while the number of low serum testosterone samples in labs remained relatively constant. This correlates directly with Google search trends that remained relatively flat from 2004 to 2016 and then absolutely hockey sticked. From 2016 to 2019, the number of testosterone prescribers grew by 28.6%, and the number of testosterone prescription claims climbed by another 54.6%. On the other hand, the mean testosterone levels of American men only declined by about 1% per year over the same time period. Depending on the diagnostic criteria used, the current market size for testosterone replacement therapy is estimated to be from between 5.6% to a whopping 78.6% of men in America. Stated more simply, after adjusting for a progressively aging population, the number of men who truly need TRT, at least by the strictest medical definition, hasn't really changed. And yet, the industry is growing at an alarming rate with an estimated market cap of roughly three quarters of the US population of males. So what gives? Who is receiving all of these prescriptions? And why? I have a hypothesis for what's driving it, but in order to understand that and for it to make sense, we're gonna have to have a shared understanding of what TRT is, how it works, and what the risks that come with it are. TRT, or testosterone replacement therapy, is a prescription treatment of testosterone given to men with hypogonadism, or low serum testosterone levels. Low serum testosterone levels, as defined by the AUA, is anything under 300 nanograms per deciliter. The standard reference range for a healthy male in America is from between 450 nanograms per deciliter to 1100 nanogram per deciliter. Anywhere in between 300 and 450 is considered borderline and is a potential candidate for treatment as well. In conjunction with low serum testosterone levels, hypogonadism is diagnosed using a collection of the following clinical symptomatology. There's a variety of sexual symptoms such as reduced libido, erectile dysfunction, and a decrease in sporadic erections. Some of the physical symptoms include an increase in body fat and a decrease in overall muscle mass, reduced bone density, and also hot flashes or night sweats. There's also cognitive and emotional symptoms such as fatigue and decreased energy levels, a decrease in overall mood, and difficulty with concentration or memory. And then there's some other general symptoms that may occur, like anemia, which is a low red blood cell count, reduced overall vitality, or just a decrease in motivation. The treatment can be administered in a number of different ways, although by far the most popular is intramuscularly injected suspensions of testosterone. These are typically administered daily, weekly, or bi-weekly, although there is an option to have a long-term slow-release pellet installed as well. Healthy male testes on average produce four to seven milligrams of testosterone per day, or 20 28 to 49 milligrams per week. Their production varies over the course of the day, but it is a constant and sustained release. TRT treatments, however, range as widely as 50 milligrams to upwards of 400 milligrams per week, with 200 milligrams being by far the most popular dose. Upon injection, there is a massive uptick in serum testosterone levels as opposed to the constant and sustained release produced by the testicles. By far the most popular suspension of testosterone is testosterone cypionate, which has a half-life of about eight days. This means that by the time your next injection rolls around, if you're injecting once a week, your testosterone levels will have declined by roughly half. Now, for some folks, this can result in a bit of a physical and emotional roller coaster every week. And if you miss an injection by a week, or if you go on a vacation to somewhere that testosterone is likely not just legal to carry in, because most places it's not, and you decide not to bring your medication with you, by the end of those two weeks, you're likely going to have declined to zero nanograms per deciliter, which is going to result in every single low T symptom that testosterone replacement therapy is designed to combat. Now, a lot of clinicians nowadays aren't simply seeking a biologically equivalent rate of replacement for testosterone, but rather what they consider an optimized dose. And some clinics even place a really heavy emphasis on achieving super physiological levels of testosterone, which honestly aren't that different than what you might see in someone on a lower cycle of anabolic steroids. And I believe this is in direct response to consumer demand rather than because of its treatment efficacy. Without specific secondary medications taken in parallel, such as HCG, TRT 100% shuts off your natural testosterone production. It also will result in infertility for the duration of the treatment. The longer that you're on TRT, the more likely it becomes that should you ever choose to come off, your natural testosterone production, as well as fertility, will never come back. Dr. Peter Atia has stated that in his experience within his practice, being on TRT for roughly two years is when most people start to see an inability to restore natural testosterone production if they ever came off. The outcomes for fertility, according to the literature, are typically a little bit better than this, though there is always a risk of permanent infertility. What about some of the alternatives we're seeing gain popularity, like oral delivery of enclomiphene as opposed to an injection? Now, these are being marketed as monthly subscription services through Instagram. You'll see ones like Maximus Tribe being really popular. These do technically work. They increase overall testosterone levels, However, because of the way in which they work, it actually prevents 
testosterone from reaching the brain in the same way, thus reducing or removing all of the positive cognitive benefits of testosterone, as well as increases in libido. So most of the reasons someone would choose to get on in the first place. If you do decide to come off, even with appropriate medical interventions and doctor supervision, you're looking at typically six months to one year before your natural testosterone production comes back to a normal non-hypogonadal level. Even then, it's all but guaranteed it won't return to quite the same level that your original natural baseline was. It'll probably be slightly lower. During the six months to one year, pretty much all of the symptoms of low T are going to be omnipresent, and I can tell you this from experience, it is absolutely miserable. TRT, when done through one of these T clinics for hormone optimization rather than a true medical need for hy treating hypogonadism, is often not covered by insurance and can range in price from $200 a month to $1,000 a month. Because of this really high cost, it's not uncommon for men to go the underground lab route, where the cost can be as low as $10 per month. This, of course, carries with it tremendous risk because you're not getting anything that's verified to be legitimate testosterone. It might be mixed with other things. It might not be clean, etc., etc. And these are also the same types of individuals who are usually more likely to forego precautions like getting regular blood work. For men who are truly hypogonadal and experiencing all a number, if not all, of the symptoms of low testosterone, TRT can in fact be a life-changing treatment. In some ways, it really is the fountain of youth that it's purported to be for those people. They can expect the opposite of every symptom previously described for low T. They'll have an increase in muscle mass, a decrease in overall body fat, increased libido, an increased subjective feeling of overall well-being, greater cognitive health, improvement of health markers in the blood, and even some longer-term cardio and neuroprotective effects as well. But what happens to folks who start TRT when their baseline is already at a normal or sufficient level. Dr. Mike summarizes this quite eloquently. Why are you bringing sand to the beach? Now the key to this is in the name. It's called testosterone replacement therapy. In so long as you're going to an above board doctor who is really only seeking a biologically equivalent rate of replacement or somewhere similar to a biologically equivalent rate of replacement, you're ultimately just going to be swapping your endogenous hormone production for an exogenous hormone source which almost universally is a bad idea if it's not required. And particularly considering the fact that in this case, it's not unlikely that it becomes a lifelong sentence. But what if you went somewhere that was going beyond just a biological rate of replacement? What if you doubled, tripled, or quadrupled your testosterone levels? Well, then this is no longer testosterone replacement therapy and it is now testosterone enhancement therapy. I'm trying to remember, when else do we use the word enhanced when it comes to testosterone? Oh yeah, that's right. In all seriousness though, what happened? Well, your mileage may vary. Let's say that you're on the low end of normal going into treatment, roughly 400 nanograms per deciliter, but you don't experience any of the clinical symptomatology of low testosterone. And you go to a clinic that replaces to the very high end of normal or even a little bit past it, we'll say 1200. You've now tripled your natural testosterone production. Will this do great things for your muscle mass and body fat percentage? Almost certainly. Will you also now experience nearly every side effect that comes with lower dose anabolic steroid use? Also almost certainly. Because that is now what you're doing. It's just under doctor supervision. These fun side effects include, but are most certainly not limited to, decreased health markers in your blood, a need to donate blood on a monthly or every other month basis, which just sucks, increased risk for cardiovascular disease, your sexual function is gonna go way up, probably to an inconvenient level. You're gonna be at an increased risk for gyno or hair loss. You're gonna potentially run into cystic acne or just general acne. The potential for anger issues, roid rage, and other psychological disturbances increases pretty dramatically. And steroid users, because again, testosterone is just a steroid, are on average 2.8 times more likely to die over the same time period than non-steroid users. A number of these can be combated or mitigated by taking additional drugs to combat the side effects, but then you're just taking a whole bunch of drugs. Now, the reason for this risk of negative side effects being so high is that if you're at 400 nanograms per deciliter experiencing none of the side effects of low T, then it likely means that you're extremely receptive to androgens. So cranking that number up by three times is going to make it extraordinarily likely that you experience all the side effects that come with both high levels of androgens in the body and high receptivity to those androgens. This is why it's so important in my opinion that a diagnosis and treatment of low T is both from a low serum testosterone level and a combination of I would say three to five of the symptoms of te low testosterone that are significantly inhibiting your ability to go through your day-to-day -day life. It's also important and I want to emphasize this that you're experiencing a number of those symptoms because if you're experiencing any one of the symptoms in isolation, like erectile dysfunction by itself, depression by itself, low mood by itself, 
it's almost certainly not caused by low testosterone. And regardless of whether or not there are benefits to replacing to the very top end of physiological or super physiological ranges, which outweigh the inherent risks to doing so, this is not a casual decision. It's potentially a lifelong decision. And people are treating it like a choice between whether or not they want to risk it and have the whole milk latte, or if they know they should play it safe and have the oat milk latte to start their day. So now that we have a shared understanding of what TRT is, how it works, and some of the risks that come with it, we can have an honest conversation about what is, in my opinion, driving this ridiculous uptick in usage. The number of men not having sex has nearly tripled in the last decade. Collective data across all of the dating apps shows that about 67% of the user base is male, and we swipe right, or yes, about 46% of the time. Whereas the remaining 33% of women swipe right only about 14% of the time. Said more simply, out of 100 people on a dating app, of the 67 males, only an optimistic four and a half of them are going to get a match. Data only from Tinder paints an even bleaker picture, where males make up 75% of the user base and only receive matches 0.6% of the time. This does seem to lend a little bit of credence to the oft-heard 20% of men are having 80% of the sex that you'll hear repeated in incel communities. 63% of single people in the US are not looking for casual dating opportunities or dating opportunities at all, with 63% of young men being single and 34% of women being single. Now this disparity is of course because women have always had a tendency to date much older, and young men can't legally often date much younger than them. So the average young male is competing against the cream of the crop of his own age bracket, which the chaff might as well not even register at this point, as well as the entirety of the potentially desirable candidates in his older cohorts. Now this has always been a problem for young men, but it's gotten significantly worse in recent years. I recently heard a definition of masculinity that I quite liked. It's the ability to generate a surplus, not just for themselves, but for the people around them. And when you're 22 to 26 years old, living at home, trying to pay off your crippling student debt, and also combating what is likely a pretty significant addiction to pornography or YouTube, you don't have a lot of surplus to offer. And considering the average age for men getting married in America is now 30.2 years old, the reality of the situation is that you're going to be spending probably quite a lot of time alone trying to prove that you're able to contribute and provide the surplus that most women are looking for. What can you do to stand out though? You can get as jacked and shredded as possible. Significantly improved or even super physiological levels of testosterone will have one heck of an ability to do that. And I hate to break it to you fellas, but the dad bod craze isn't real. At least not in the vast majority of cases. Across all real data we have, minus one planet fitness survey, women do prefer a physique with slightly above average levels of muscularity and fairly significantly below average levels of body fat. We do also have data showing that women, in fact, are more likely to be attracted to or desire a short-term fling with men who have higher testosterone levels. And what kind of culture are we in right now? We're in a hookup culture. So all roads lead to more T equals more opportunity. And yes, I'm very proud of that one. In a world where more men than ever are intentionally shattering their legs to have them extended, relearning how to walk, all in an effort to be deemed just a little bit more attractive by the women who on average are attracted to men or most satisfied by men eight inches taller than them, choosing to inject testosterone is not even a drop in the looks maxing bucket. Now, considering that the average height of a female in America is five foot four, that puts the average male for most satisfactory at six feet tall or tall, which I hate to break it to you ladies, but only 14 and a half percent of men in America are six feet or tall. Ew, don't talk to me unless he makes six figures. Well, only 18% of men in America do. Now don't even get me started on mewing, hair transplants, Ozempic, or any of the other looks maxing trends that have taken social media by storm. Social media has definitively and perhaps permanently moved the needle for not only what is deemed desirable, but also for what is deemed average in a way that I think is extraordinarily destructive to our overall well-being. Bodybuilding and fitness used to be a fairly niche interest reserved mainly for the magazines and forums. Now you can't scroll through social media for more than 10 seconds without being exposed to someone who is jacked or shredded out of their mind, surrounded by beautiful people because of that fact. In a relative sense, even the action heroes of the 90s and early 2000s look like absolute betas by the standards purported today. With each day that we're exposed to this new norm and reminded in all the ways in which we are insufficient or can't measure up to that, the desperation in many men grows 
greater and greater by the day. And what does desperation fuel? Well, often stupidity. But in our consumer society, so focused on quick fixes and magic pills, it also fuels spending. It fuels making short-term decisions without caring about the longer-term consequences. And in TRT, we have both of those. A short-term fix that, as long as you're willing to shell out some cash and stay on it over the long term, can truly deliver on so many of the benefits that it promises. And if you go to the right place, it's all legal and above board. But it's no different than all of the reasons driving the steroid epidemic that we're being faced with today. In fact, I think it's part and parcel of the steroid epidemic and potentially a large contributing factor. But let's say you're already happily married or you're in the rare few who's not worried about living up to any arbitrary set of standards. Do you wanna get old? If I were a betting man, I'd have put some money on you saying no just now. In a survey conducted by Men's Health, the data shows that we men feel conflicted about aging. 56% of men only felt pretty good about being middle-aged. 60% of them aren't as fit as they would like to be. 40% of men were upbeat while the other 60% were either stressed, indifferent, or lonely. 23% of them listed their greatest fear as getting old and slowing down, ranking that above things like losing a significant relationship or experiencing an unforeseen tragedy. 42% of them only had sex once a month or less, which was the largest percentage answer for any of them available. More than 40% of them weren't happy with their own family life and more than 50% of them weren't satisfied with their work. And guess what gets marketed to men at the age of 35 or older as a potential panacea for all of these things? TRT. And sure, our testosterone levels do decline as we get older. Eventually, the vast majority of us will reach something approaching true hypogonadal status and experience most of the symptoms that come with low T. At that point, TRT is not only a viable option for potentially treating some less objective markers of health, it also has high potential to be a very effective treatment of objective markers of health. It also has a number of truly profound benefits to your heart, brain, and bone density that aren't to be overlooked. Some of the potential risks and downsides of being on all the time also tend to de decrease as we get older. Fewer and fewer of us have lifestyles that make it difficult to manage a regular and consistent injection schedule, and we may also just be less worried about our fertility in the long term. It's also just, as you get older, less and less time that you're gonna have to worry about stabbing yourself with a needle. And with retirement ages likely to continue getting higher in conjunction with our increased lifespans, being able to maintain high levels of performance and optimizing our health is going to be important for a lot of people. But there is one glaring hole in all of that. No matter what you do, you're still going to die someday. All of us are. Now, will the coming singularity bring us an altered carbon-like reality where death is a choice rather than an inevitability? Maybe, but I don't feel optimistic that's going to happen in my lifetime. No matter what we do, no matter how much we optimize, no matter how hard we try to stay young forever, we're going to wither away someday. Humans are an ephemeral and temporary being. It doesn't matter how much we aspire to become otherwise. There's nothing wrong with accepting that for what it is and choosing to move gracefully through each stage of life rather than resisting it. TRT was at one point a treatment designed and relegated exclusively to men at the age 65 or over over or for younger people with rare conditions. Now, I'd argue that it's much more likely for the health conscious 40 year old at the office to be on TRT than it is for your grandfather to be. And maybe that's not a bad thing. Maybe it's not a signal of us putting too much value into the wrong things. And maybe it's not a big deal that we struggle so much to accept our own mortality. But then again, maybe it is. Ultimately, this is a question that only you can answer. Knowing what I know now, having lived through what I lived through, here are some questions I'd probably spend a fair bit of time answering and reflecting upon before I make the choice. Am I over the age of 35 with low serum testosterone levels and at least three to five symptoms of low T that significantly impact my quality of life? Have I tried all known and reasonable natural interventions for improving my testosterone? Level? Am I potentially ready to commit to this decision for the rest of my life? If not, am I willing to deal with the consequences of coming off? Am I worried about my ability to have children now or in the future? If I choose to enhance beyond a relatively normal rate of replacement, am I willing to no longer be considered natty? If I do that, am I willing to deal with the potential side effects that come with enhancing the super physiological levels of testosterone? Am I going to be able to maintain a reasonable injection schedule? Am I financially stable enough to ensure continuity of treatment over the long term? If any part of the answer to that first question is no, it's not your time yet. That is your pass go, potentially collect 200 megs of tests question. After that, if the answer to any of the subsequent questions is in opposition to what going on TRT requires, I still think it's not time for you yet. TRT isn't going anywhere, and its usage is only likely to increase as time goes on. I think it's part and parcel of the growing steroid epidemic, and as more young people continue to use and abuse steroids, I think we're going to see in even greater numbers of them get on testosterone
testosterone for the rest of their lives. Well, there are genuine benefits to it and a population for whom it all but certainly makes sense for. I have significant reservations about our growing tendency to employ it in progressively younger demographics. It's not a decision to be made light. And for the vast majority of men, I actually think it's the wrong decision until you're fairly far into middle age. We live in a society that continues to push our understanding of average to progressively greater extremes. And I don't think that's going to go anywhere. The temptations are going to grow ever stronger. And we're going to be continued to be marketed to in a way that makes the juice, so to speak, seem to be worth the squeeze. We also live in an age of endless information, research, and holistic natural health interventions that I think can get the vast majority of men 80 to 90% of the way that they want to get by going on TRT. And they can do that without making the leap into what is potentially a long-term, lifelong commitment, potentially wrought with side effects. If you've made it this far, thank you. It is people like you who inspire me to continue making content and help this channel grow. If you found this information helpful, interesting, useful, whatever, make sure to like, comment, and share it with a friend. And by far the single most supportive thing you can do to help me continue to grow the channel is to hit that subscribe button. And if you want to go above and beyond, you can consider becoming a patron and donating to my Patreon. Links in the description. With that, till next time, folks.